in terms of stuff, deadlines remain unchangeified. So, except for the, the minor change to the deadline for exam one, which deadlines today if you haven't done it yet, and the last two quizzes for part two, also deadline today. Otherwise, everything remains the same. Before pressing on to more new stuff, anything about the pre previous stuff or other stuff that needs more stuff? Okay. Just my terrible camera angle. More terrible. So last time we're looking at our uh, good dead friend Plato, talking about some Plato stuff. We moved on to our good dead friends and skeptics, talking about skeptical stuff. And we saw the basic idea of skepticism is the view that one does not know. And in general, the idea is if you're a skeptic, in the philosophical sense, you'd say, I can't be sure that I know stuff. And if you're a careful skeptic, you wouldn't say that you know you don't know, because then you know something. Now, skepticism breaks down into many varieties, but in general, there are the following. Firstly, we have the local or moderate skeptic. Not local because they're your friendly neighborhood skeptic, or moderate because they're incredibly moderate. The idea is that if a person is a local or moderate skeptic, their skeptic is rather limited. So if you talk to them and say, hey, moderate skeptic, can we know math stuff and logic stuff? It's a short. You can know two plus two is four. You can know squares have four sides. You can know modus ponens is valid. You can also know empirical stuff. So you can know about you know, the heart is four chambers, is human hearts, and other things about you know, the empirical universe. Where they would bring forth their skepticism, though, would be about metaphysical stuff. So if you ask them, can you know about uh, metaphysical? They would say, no, I can't know that. You can still perhaps talk about it, but you can't know that stuff. And this would be, stereotypically speaking, someone would be seen as you know fairly practical. Yeah, that's fine, yeah, empirical science is fine, but let's not get into that weird metaphysics stuff. Now the next step up towards the extreme is what's called global skepticism. Now a global skeptic is not skeptic about globes, although in a way they kind of are. They have universal doubt. So if you ask a global skeptic, is this the real world, they would say, no. If you ask them, do I have a mind, they would say, no. So they deny metaphysical truths, can't know that stuff. But they still leave in place math and logic. So if you're talking to them, they might say, yeah, this could all be the matrix, so this could all be just the dream. Everything could be unreal except for me. But if you ask them, so what about triangles? Do they have three sides? They'd say, yeah. Because whether we're in virtual reality or not, triangles are three-sided. What about math? Yeah, whether we're in virtual reality or dreaming or not, math still, still works. So they'd still accept these a priori truths. Now, just when you thought it couldn't get more skeptical, it always can. Just when you thought celebrity holograms couldn't be weirder, like that would be weirder. Because apparently Amy Winehouse, not to skepticism, but Amy Winehouse, yeah. they're creating a hologram of her, sending it on a tour. I guess they joined Tupac Shakur, who was the first celebrity hologram, which is just kind of weird. And they're also talking about making prints of your hologram. Oh, okay. It is super weird. <laughs> so you won't be able to know, is it a, is it a, well, there are celebrities who hologram themselves, even though they're still alive. And so eventually you have the question of, is the person on stage really the person there, or are they a hologram? I'm trying to figure out how they even got, like, a hologram over. Oh, they're just going to take all the pictures and, and correct them. Yeah. Because they have enough pictures. They can, if you have enough pictures of someone, you can make a, make a hologram. And some celebrities will probably get scanned, 3D scanned, so they can hologram it. Because why work when you can hologram it? I could be a hologram right now. <laughs> So the, um, yeah, so that could be a form of skepticism. How do you know if people around you are holograms or not? Now the super global or extreme skeptic has ultimate doubt. 
they doubt everything, even math and logic. So if you were talking to an extreme skeptic and said, is this the real world? They would say, I don't know. If you said to them, well, I've drawn a triangle, does it have three sides? They would say, no. What about math? They'd say, you know. Now, our example of this is also an example of a methodological skeptic. Our good dead friend, René Descartes, he goes to extreme skepticism, which I guess is skepticism where you're wearing sunglasses and hang gliding or, or something. Now, Descartes was also a methodological skeptic, which is this. If you're a methodological skeptic, skepticism is not your end game. Rather, you adopt skepticism in order to achieve some other end. And there are a variety of options. For example, our good dead friend Descartes, he tried to embrace skepticism to defeat skepticism on the view that only a skeptic can kill a skeptic. And as we'll see, what he tries to do is engage in ultimate doubt to find something that cannot be doubted. And if we can't doubt it, it could stand up even to extreme skepticism, then we can know it. There are some religious thinkers who also use skepticism to attack reason, to show that the arguments against God, you can't know that they, that they work, therefore your option is faith. And so they would use skepticism not to say we don't know anything, they would use it to try to get people to accept God. And so you could be an extreme skeptic, but doing it for a different reason. What's the like most common skeptic you would see? Like probably, probably the most common would be like the local skeptic, okay. people who would say they would say you know okay I believe in math I believe in you know empirical stuff thing I can see, but then when people start talking about weird philosophical things like you know Plato's forms and other other worlds, uh, probably most people would say that's pretty sketchy stuff. It may be kind of interesting, but really can't. Know that kind of thing. Yeah, so far most people are skeptical about you know, weird, weird science and weird, weird philosophy. The extreme skeptics are probably pretty uncommon because usually you start getting like bored and then forget about being skeptical, or you get hungry, or you get a toothache. And most of them like they don't deny math and logic because it's like unchanging throughout worlds. Yeah, because the, the idea is you know people who think math and logic is you can't deny it. They think that it's something that is just, you know, yeah, fixed across. There's no place where it doesn't doesn't work, supposedly. And as I'll say when you get to Descartes, Descartes tries to say mm, you can't can't even trust that stuff. And at that point, he thinks we can get out of it. But some critics have said that if you go that far, there's no there's no coming back because there's no way to even you know even argue about coming back. Now, skepticism has a long and storied history. Or maybe it doesn't. Who knows? They're skeptics. It goes back to the skeptikos of ancient Greek. The literal translation would be sifters. And their view was that our claims lack a foundation. Because they were trying to find knowledge and foundation. But their view was, well, we just don't, don't have that. And there have been many schools of skepticism. Now in a way it's kind of odd for skeptics to argue and write stuff out because you know on their view they can't know stuff so perhaps the greatest skeptic of all would be someone you never heard about because they wouldn't talk about it or even you know, do anything about it. It could be you know Sally or Larry the Walmart reader they're the greatest skeptic in human history but they don't talk about it because they're, they're skeptics. <clears throat> now one of the, the skeptics that's pretty famous is a fellow named Pyro of Ellis. Uh, not Pyro like burning stuff, because that would be kind of cool. Maybe there were Pyromania Peronians. But his name was Pyro, and he lived in Ellis from 320 to 27 BC. Now, what he did was revitalize skepticism. He looked at past skepticism and said, hey, let's bring this back, which is a common thing in philosophy, science, and politics. <coughs> Now, we don't have any writings of his, and maybe for reasons similar to why we have none for Socrates, because Socrates said philosophy is about talking, not writing, so we just have what Plato wrote about it. Or maybe that he just 
you know, said, hey, you can't know anything, so why, why write stuff down? Now, he presented it's kind of the definitive argument that becomes a lamprey and leech attached to claims of knowledge ever since. And then he presents a second argument, which is not quite as strong, but still pretty good. But here's his first argument. He's basically doing an argument by elimination. And as we saw before, there's kind of two ways you can do these arguments. One is kind of the Sherlock Holmes method, where you know or believe or have evidence that you only have so many options, say, you know, five. To use a Sherlock Holmes example, you know you have five suspects, you don't know which one did it, but you know one of them did it. And then if you can argue by elimination and show four definitely didn't do it, whoever's left, Mr. Pinky, has to be the guilty, guilty party. Now there's also argument to destruction, where you'd say there's only, say, two or three options, then you argue against all of those and say, well, these are the only two possibilities, none of them can work, therefore nothing can work. And what Pyro is doing here is an argument to destruction. He says there's only two ways you can know stuff, they both fail, so you can't know stuff. I think the first one becomes the devil that haunts philosophy ever since. So one way we can supposedly get knowledge is you know, the empirical approach through our senses. And Pyro presents the following devastating problem. To know that our sensory experiences, what's going on in our mind, is real, corresponding to reality, we have to know that what's going on in, in our minds matches what's out there, which would require that we can somehow get outside of our mind and see <laughs> them matching up, which of course we can't do. Because no matter, as Buckaroo Banzai said, no matter where you go, there you are. You can never get out of your own head. So, since we can never match those two up, I never know that my seeming to see the backpack or this room corresponds to a real backpack or a real room. I can never get out of my own to use a metaphor that Pyro didn't use, you can imagine kind of a Twilight Zone, you know, black mirror scenario. Imagine that you wake up in a room, you're, you have no memories, but you can still use language, etc. And all around you, there's no door, but all around you are computer monitors. And you hear, you know, a voice booms out, you know, you must decide which image is corresponds to what's outside of this room. If you are wrong, you'll be punished. Like, oh crap. <laughs> and the zapper, you know, the zapper comes down from the ceiling. Now, looking at the images, can you tell which ones are real and which aren't? No. So, because you can't get out of the room. So you have no way of knowing what's real and what's not. And so in the analogy or metaphor, the room is like our mind. We can never get out of it. All we have is what we see on our internal monitor, so to speak, and so we never know what's truly real. And again, this argument is haunted philosophy ever since. No one really has been able to, to, to beat it. <laughs> now, a person could, of course, say, well, if my senses can't work, I can use reason, reason to the rescue. Now, he has a weaker argument here, and it goes like this. If you present an argument for something, he claims, you can always have an equally good counter-argument against it. So, if you're going by reason, any claim you argue for, you can also argue against equally well, and so there's no grounds for picking one over the other. So reason can't help us, or so he claims. Now, of course, this is much weaker because there do seem to be cases where there are good arguments for something and the arguments against it are very, very good. That there's not a perfect balance. And so this one is, is weaker. This one's really strong. <laughs> That's kind of a, yeah, it's a devil that haunts philosophy. Can you give an example of like when you 
had a recent argument like? Oh, um, like an argument that would they be balanced? Yeah. Oh, you know, let's go we can use the example of the celebrity holograms. There's actually a pretty balanced argument for both positions. Mm -hmm. One position is is that it's, you know, it just kind of it's desecrates the memory of a celebrity to have, you know create a hologram to have them prance and dance around on stage performing. But the counter argument is, if the uh, if a person never had a chance to see the original person in concert, and the concert is done respectfully, you know, respectfully, not like you know, you know, gr you know, grotesquely, and some of the money is being used, say, like in Amy Winehouse's case, using the fund, um, you know, a, a charity program. And so in that case, you could argue, well, there's a really good reason not to do it, but equally good reason to to do it. Or think of almost any political issue. Like every every political position, like raise taxes, lower taxes, um, free college, not free college. There's always good arguments. If we set aside our political feelings and try to look at them objectively, we can see there's pretty good arguments for either side. And so, in those cases, you can pretty much always find like a good argument for, a good argument against. But they're saying like the other people say like sometimes. There is no better argument, so like we can argue with us for being on the table, but like a counter argument won't be really good for it. Well, you'd say, well, for that, we could say, well, I could be hallucinating. Okay. You know, or, it could be, or it could be a hologram, because you know they're holograms, so maybe it's all, maybe I'm a hologram, and you just think you're, you know, that someone's actually teaching this class, and that projector is projecting this plus also, also me. No, but a fair point is you could say, well, some that argument's kind of dumb, <laughs> you know, because you could like with a hologram, you can't touch it, so you could like throw something. Yeah, if, it go, if it doesn't go through me, then I'm probably not a, probably not a hologram. Yeah, and so this is probably a weaker one because there do seem to be cases where you've got a good argument, and the argument against it is not so great. For example, if you take something like uh, genocide, there are arguments for genocide, but they're all pretty bad compared to arguments against it. Or arguments for, um, well, like the movie The Purge, like legalizing all crimes, you know, for 24 hours. And there are some arguments for that, but they're all pretty, you know, all the arguments against it are much, much better. And they actually made four of those things, <laughs> so probably more. Just keep keep running it. So if we buy into the skepticism. What should we do? Well, the skeptic says, since reason can't help us, senses can't help us, we can't know stuff. Now, but of course, we still seem to have 24 hours a day to fill up, seven days a week, 365 days a year, so what do we do? Well, we can talk about how things seem to be. It's like, it seems like there's a backpack. It seems like pizza is delicious. It seems like, you know, we're in a, in a room. So what they end up suggesting is a practical, prudent approach, namely suspend judgment, don't make any assumptions, and just kind of go along. You can't be, be sure. Now, interestingly, they also apply this to morality and laws. So if you're in society, what should you do? Well, their claim is you can't know if anything's really good or, or bad. You can't know whether the laws are just or unjust. So they, they propose adopting apathy and indifference. Now today, we often think of apathy and indifference in negative terms. We think of apathy as someone who's, in a way, kind of like hostile. And indifference as being like cruel indifference, like letting people just like die, starve to death or freeze to death. Now what apathy means, in the sense of the skeptic means apathetic, meaning from pathos, meaning emotions, it means being basically without emotion. And indifference means not like cruel indifference, like all oh, those people die. It means that you're not you know, biased or prejudiced one way or another. So basically it would be sort of um, without emotion or particular side with anything. It'd be, well, in a way kind of Mechanical, I suppose. So then what do you do about laws, traditions, and morality? Well, their claim is 
you don't know whether they're good or bad or not, so just go along. Now, in a way, kind of weirdly, if a skeptic, the most radical skeptic of the Peronian you know, school, they would seem, in terms of like how they behave, they would seem pretty super normal, probably almost terrifyingly normal, because they would just go along, you know, like they they would go if they, if, if they're in their social group, went to church every Sunday, they'd be church to church every Sunday, they'd be following the laws, you know, carefully. They wouldn't seem particularly upset about things, you know, so they'd seem like I guess upper class people in America, <laughs> you know, except when they get upset about you know losing privilege and stuff. Yeah, so they would seem just very calm, conservative. Mitt Romney, not pick on Mitt, but they'd seem a lot like Mitt Romney because <laughs> they'd be very calm, you know, not too upset about things, following the laws and traditions. So maybe Mitt Romney is like the greatest skeptic. He probably was like, yes, I, so I realized that I cannot know anything, so I should be super calm. Now, after the Peronians came more skeptics, because you need, just like us, like Doritos, you need a lot of varieties. Now, one somewhat ironic form of skepticism were the ac academic skeptics, so-called because they were in Plato's Academy, and they ironically took it over. The first one is Arcesilus, you know, probably totally mispronouncing that, but who knows, because he's super dead. Uh, he's the first guy that steered it away from you know, Plato's Platoing to skepticism. The next person was Carnides, 214 to 129. He took over after the previous guy. And in addition to his philosophizing, he was sent to Rome as the Athenian ambassador. And back in those days, before the Netflix and so forth, one of the entertainments was philosophers. They would go out on the streets and give philosophical speeches and people would gather around. And what he used was the famous two-faced method. Not two-faced like the famous Batman bill. You didn't get up there with like one half of his face scarred up, flipping a coin, and then murdering people and became unscarred. No, what he'd do is the method suggested by Paro. He would give a brilliant argument in favor of one thing one day, say, an argument about how one should be charitable and kind, and the next day he would give an equally good speech about the exact opposite. And his point was to show that you could argue, as Pyro claimed, for any position and against that position with equally good arguments. So why did the Academy become skeptical? Well. The skeptics who took it over believed that it had lost the true spirit of Socrates. Now, again, it's somewhat ironic because one of Socrates' main enemies were the sophists who embraced skepticism, but they tried to assuage that by saying, well, Socrates claimed he knew nothing, and the dialogues ended without a definitive conclusion. But of course, it was rather ironic because the whole point of Plato's work was to you know, show that we have knowledge, and then it gets taken over by skeptics. Maybe like having a political party dedicated to, say, equality, getting taken over by racists, and then saying, we're just doing what they did before. It's like, okay, probably not. Now, the main opponents of these skeptics were, in Rome, the Stoics and Epicureans. We have the terms today, of course, Stoicism and Epicureanism. And the Stoics, their view, super condensed version, their view was this. Everything that happens is going to happen. Nothing you can do, do about it. Now, not in the sense that we're weak and powerless, but in the sense that the universe is determined. Everything that occurs, must occur, can't be differently. And in their famous metaphor, each of us is like a dog tied to a car being pulled by a mule. And life is the car. Now, we have two options. We can try to resist, in which case we'll be dragged through the street, um, or we can just trot along beside the, the car. And their point is that it's all in our attitude towards things. You know, it's, we don't have any control over what's going to what's going to happen because everything is set and determined, but we can choose how we respond. One of the most famous Stoics was a fellow named Marcus Aurelius, the emperor. 
And if you ever saw the movie Gladiator, old movie though, but he is the character in that movie. He, one of the movies obviously not like the, exactly the real Marcus Aurelius, but he was a real, real person. And he wrote the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, in which he basically talks about how to deal with suffering and pain in life. And their view basically is pain is inevitable, but our response to it is our in our choice. And they all die. They left behind, but they left behind the term stoic. The Epicureans believed they were part of more fun to party with, because their deal was pleasure. Their view was what you should do in life is what is enjoyable. And the skeptics uh, went after the Stoics and Epicureans because the Stoics and Epicureans claimed we could know stuff, and the skeptics said, nope. Now, one counter put forth by you know, sensible people is some things we seem to experience seem like we can't doubt them. For example, if you need a root canal of a dentist, you're probably not going to say, hmm, I wonder if this is real or not. You're probably going to be pretty, pretty sure. But the skeptics point out, this becomes a stock kind of reply, that we can have dreams, hallucinations, that seem quite convincing, but are false. And then, of course, if you jump ahead to today and bring in technology like virtual reality, then we can be completely fooled. So what arguments do the academic skeptics use? Well, they bring forth one that becomes another devil to haunt philosophy for centuries. So probably the best one so far has been the one about the problem of the external world. You can't get outside of your own mind. Then the balanced argument one is weaker because there do seem to be cases where one argument is good and the others are pretty terrible. This is another, again, deep sort of devil argument. Here's how it goes. It's an infinite rigorous argument. Suppose someone says, here is a standard of truth. What you see with your own eyes is true. Well, the skeptic will say, well, how do you know that what you see with your own eyes is true? You just stand it. Well, if the person gives a reason as to why they can trust what they see with their own eyes, then, of course, the skeptic can say, well, how do you know that that? And if the person does, gives a reason, they can bring up the question again, how do you know that works? Now, if the person doesn't give any reason, then of course they're not giving any reason. So it's kind of a mean dilemma. If someone says, I have no reason, the skeptic can just kind of smirk and say, no reason. If the person gives a reason, the skeptic can say, aha, give me a reason. Um, does that need a reason? And if, they, if they have no reason for that, then they can smirk and say, aha. Or if a person gives another reason, they can just run that regress. So, do. And again, this one is used to torment uh, knowledge, been used ever since. Now, the clever skeptic, of course, doesn't claim that we know that we don't know, because then they would know something. They claim we seem to lack knowledge. So, the clever skeptic doesn't claim to know their, that skepticism is true, they just say, yeah, we don't seem to know stuff. Now, one criticism advanced by the Stoics was this. If someone like, just didn't believe that anything was real, you know, they would, it would seem to be almost like, well, very much like a mental illness. Like, you know, I don't know if you know, my lunch is real. I don't know if this, my job is real. And if someone truly accepted you know, apathy and indifference, they just wouldn't do anything. They just kind of lay there. I guess slowly die, maybe. So, a bit of a problem. Now, Carnides tried to create a compromise, but of course, compromise, as everyone knows these days, just leads to everybody hating you. And his compromise was this He claimed you can't be certain, but you can have probability. Here's a modern example You can't be sure that getting hit by a bus would hurt, but it probably would. So best not to do that. You can't be sure that you know um, high blood pressure is bad for you, or even that you have blood. But you probably should take care of that because probably bad for you. You probably do have blood. Now, the main criticism, of course, from the non-skeptics was well, probability requires having some knowledge. 
And the attack from the skeptics was, hey, you're not being a skeptic. And so, as all compromises go, no one was happy. Before pressing on, anything about this that needs more stuff? Now, Promian skepticism was a revival, and then it kind of got out of fashion, kind of like uh, bell-bottom jeans, and then it came back again, much like bell-bottom jeans. Only this time they were called flare jeans. And they'll come back as something else. I don't know what they're called. Maybe internet jeans or, or something. Who knows? So why did the Protean skeptics return? Well, the story is very similar to the way politics works. Usually what happens is you have like a political party or a group, and it goes along for a while, and then it gets kind of, you know, off the original path. And from the standpoint of, you know, purists, it becomes impure. And then people believe they have to come back and purify. Well, for example, back when uh, President Obama was elected twice, the Republicans were like, holy crap, we're, we're losing the presidency. What do we do? And some said, well, we need to bring in more people. And others said, no, we need to double down hard on you know, the, these core, you know, these pure values. And they doubled down hard, and Trump got elected. So I guess it worked out well for them. Now, a similar sort of thing that happened to the Peronians. They were like, ah, these academics, you know, they are not skeptical enough. You know, we're, we're losing. What do we do? And the Peronians said, what we got to do, we got to get pure. We got to go back to our roots and just be pure skeptics. And so they took the old time skepticism, used pyro, because what people typically do in politics and philosophy is they look back to the glories of the past and say how great it used to be, and they're making skepticism great again. So very similar to how politics works. So the person behind this was a fellow named Agrippa, and he presented the five pillars of skepticism, which is handy because, you know, Five fingers, five pillars. Now he claims in these pillars, they're essentially traps. If anybody tries to say, hey, I know stuff, he believes they'll collide with one of the pillars, if not all of them. And he also thinks that if the first four pillars don't like clobber somebody, there's a fifth pillar that he can't get around, that just clobbers everything. And these are essentially in terms of what they do, again, basically their reasons, sort of ironically, why we can't know stuff. First one is this, disagreement. Not everyone will agree on an issue. Now, is that true? Yeah, you can take almost any issue, even ones that seem like most people would agree, like um, waffles, for example, but there's always that person who doesn't like waffles. I mean, I can see if something like a waffle allergy, that makes sense, but. Now, this is true, but of course, it's not a really powerful pillar because the mere fact that people disagree by itself doesn't prove that we don't know stuff. Because people would, I mean, if you believe that we know stuff, you would say, yeah, people disagree. Um, and in some cases, you know, most of them are wrong. The second pillar is a really strong pillar. It's you know, stolen from the academic skeptics, and it's the infinite regress again. So suppose we have a dispute, we have this disagreement, and if we give a reason for it, for our position on something, say we're arguing about oh, whether it's morally okay to use holographs of celebrities when they're dead, and if we give an argument for it, then the skeptic can say, well, what's your justification for that argument? And if you give a justification, they can say, well, what's the justification for that argument? And so on, on to infinity. And we get into one of those super nasty infinite regresses. And again, this is one of the kind of fatal arguments. So if you try to give the skeptic a reason that supports your, you know, your claim, then they just say, well, what's the reason for that? What's the reason for that? Forever. And if you don't give any reason, then they can just say, well, you got no, no reason. So, pretty nasty trap. Third pillar, relativity. Now, the skeptics realized correctly that perceptions differ 
in different circumstances. Things look I mean, to use a you know, concrete example. Um, colors look differently in different lights. And I'll use two examples. I some years ago, one of my friends, um, she, she like showed me like her, her makeup mirror and had like all kinds of switches and different lights. I'm like, why is your mirror so complicated? Why does it have so many, why does it even have switches? <laughs> my mirror doesn't have switches, it's just this mirror. And she explained to me that there are different settings for like work, going out to the clubs, uh, like light, you know, nighttime, daytime, etc. And depending on what, you know, what look she was going for, she would adjust the, the lighting. And she like demonstrated, I'm like, yeah, that does make, make a difference. She's like, I already missed, I'm like, no, I'm just sticking with my, my mirror, I look terrible no matter what the light is, so no problem there. And so that seemed true. Now one thing I'm familiar with that I know, uh, another example that works, is if you're painting like your house a problem or whatever. And one thing, of course, anybody who knows painting will recommend is you don't go to the like Lowe's or Home Depot, just look at their samples and say, yep, that looks good and just buy the paint and paint. Because the way it looks in the you know the light in the store, typically fluorescent lighting, very bright, could look quite different from what you paint, you know, for real. A good example would be like Suppose someone picks like a blue color, it looks good, you know, it looks very blue, bright blue in the fluorescent light. They go home paint like their bathroom that hasn't got any windows, but has the fancy mirror. And suddenly they're like, wow, that's really creepy, dark, scary blue. <laughs> looks like a nightmare bathroom. And so, you know, their skeptics are right. Depending on what conditions you're in, the same color could look very, very different. Now, of course, that by itself doesn't guarantee skepticism because you could you could say yes colors look differently in different conditions but of course you can adjust for that in fact they they do if you if anybody here does like uh, you know visual arts or graphic design you can you know you do things like you calibrate your monitor and you, you understand like how the light affects the color sure it's all you know way relative to the light but it's you know you can have a pretty good idea how the lights work with different colors Fourth pillar, pretty strong one, which is this. As I mentioned, one way you can try to beat the skeptic is say, I'm not gonna give any justification except this one. Here's the reason why it's true, and that's it. This is the starting point, is the assumption. So what the skeptics say is that, well, every starting point is arbitrary. So if a person says, the senses can be trusted, and the person says, well, do you have a reason for that? And you know, the skeptic says, you have a reason, the person says, no, this is just a starting point. Well, this, someone else could say well, there's a starting point, like Descartes or Plato, the senses can't be trusted. And so it would seem that any starting point that's picked is completely arbitrary, so you have no reason to accept one over the other. So they create kind of a nice trap. If you give reasons, they can keep you running reasons forever, and if you don't give reasons, then they can just say, well, that's arbitrary, there's no reason. Lastly, the final kind of catch-all pillar is this. Agrippa claimed that if somehow one achieved the seemingly impossible and got around all four of the other pillars, they could only do so by being circular, by simply assuming is true what must be proven. So it'd have to beg the question. Now, interestingly, there's a fellow recently dead, so not super dead, uh, this guy Chisholm, he wrote um, an essay long ago before he was dead, in which he argues that the only way you can be the skeptic is by assuming that we know stuff. So he essentially says, yeah, it's gotta be circular, but this, this works. And of course the skeptics say back to him, no, but it doesn't work, it's circular. And he says back, yeah, it works. So as it comes down to people saying to each other, you're wrong, and they say back, no, you're wrong. And that doesn't help a lot. Now later skeptics say, said, why go with five? Why don't I just go with two? And so the slimmed down version went with this. First, there is nothing that is self-evident, contrary to you know, Plato and others. Secondly, that the claim is that nothing can be, can be proven. So nothing is provable. And so, 
to the skeptic's satisfaction, no options. So you can't just know it, you know, by the light of natural reason, and you can't prove it. So nothing can be can be known. So what are they trying to get to? Well, end game was this: personal peace. Because if you can't know, there's no reason to work. As Song says, "Don't worry, be happy." So, how do you behave? Well, according to skeptics, you know, these revived Protean skeptics, very similar to the original Protean skeptics and academics, simply accept what seems to be, follow the existing customs and laws, and just go along. As I mentioned, if someone truly embraced the skepticism, unless you ask them, hey, are you a philosophical skeptic, they would seem perfectly normal. They would just be you know, driving a minivan, taking their kids to soccer, you know, saying all the normal things to say, whatever their social class was, they would just do that. And you wouldn't be able to tell them for anybody else. And sort of the motivation for this is, would be achieving peace. You just not worry about, about things. You know, don't question, don't worry. Now, of course, that seems kind of problematic because it is saying literally, don't question, don't. Don't worry, just go along. And so it's kind of weird that you know a system of skepticism and doubt would lead to people just accepting, you know, just going along with things, which is you know, kind of a wrong. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Why would the thinkers <laughs> suggest that? Well, because because <laughs> man, maybe I'm. I, as a thinker, I wouldn't suggest that you would ask, ask questions and go along. Mm -hmm. So I'm, please explain to me why the thinkers of a nation mm -hmm. or a society would say you don't ask questions, just go along. Oh, in the case of these guys, the, the skeptics, their belief is you can't know anything. So you, there's no way, none of the answers you get matter because you don't know whether they're correct or not. So why, why ask? That's the reason you ask, because yeah, I don't know. So Let's say you can never know. So your question, their view would be, these guys would, oh. would be your questions would be pointless, because you never have no way of knowing. Every question you ask, whatever answer you get, you have no way of knowing if it's correct. So their view is, you know, since you can't know anything, why, why bother? In a sad state. Well, these guys, yeah, they, and they did. <laughs> they did come to a sad state, because. Um, they ended up, you know, failing. And so why were the skeptics, you know, important? Why do we still care about them if we do? Well, they did run into some, some in a way, kind of ironically fatal problems. Although the skeptic, in a way, is kind of unbeatable, they, they have weaknesses because to make their arguments, their killer skeptical arguments, they've got to use arguments. So they have to accept that argumentation works. And so, to the degree they engage in argumentation, they have to accept that argumentation is actually effective, that they have starting points. As I mentioned, sort of the purest skeptic who truly embraced skepticism wouldn't argue, wouldn't say anything. They would, you just would never know, because they wouldn't even talk about past the people. Yeah, because they would just wake up, can't know anything, can't even know if they're, they're arguing. But why, despite this, were they important? Well, one thing is, Skeptics become kind of a good nemesis. It, you know, they're, they're philosophers themselves, but they become a, a nemesis for other philosophers who aren't skeptics because you have to you have to beat them. You know, they raise these challenges and arguments, and you've got to got to address them. Um, Saint Augustine, for example, wrote against the academic skeptics, and later thinkers like Descartes took their skepticism and used it as a tool against skepticism, and it was also used in, somewhat ironically, as I mentioned before, by religious thinkers. Because if you have all these arguments against God that are based on reason, but you can show that you can't know anything, well, all that's left is faith in revelation, or just skepticism. Also, it's believed it helped in the development of science. Because a healthy skepticism, you know, show me or prove it to me, is good. It's only when the skepticism becomes sort of like, I doubt everything, I'm just going to go along and you know, not ask questions, it becomes a, a problem. 
So what happened to the skeptics? Well, they were for a while again big. I mean, they were they were like, you know, they were a thing. They were hanging on the street corners of Rome, giving speeches, and getting the hippies. The hippies. Exactly like hippies. So they didn't have any up a tool or VW vans. Those lay those lay in the future. <laughs> Now, what led to their failure was they didn't deliver the goods. Namely, the skepticism didn't make people feel peaceful. It merely created confusion. Like, you don't know, you don't know anything. Like, ah. And it wasn't very satisfying. Like I said, it's not very satisfactory to say, well, I don't know nothing, I'm just gonna go, go along. They were also up against a very strong competitor, namely uh, other religious, philosoph or religious philosophies, and of course, most importantly, up against Christianity. Which instead of Christianity instead of saying you don't know nothing, just go along, Christianity said, you know, heaven. Which is more selling appeal than you don't know nothing. <laughs> so they didn't achieve their goal of like trying to let everybody have personal peace because the people weren't peaceful with what they were saying. Yeah, because when I mean, we think about it, if you believe like I can't know I mean on one hand at first it feels kinda of like I can't be sure about anything. Imagine like you go to the doctors and you find out like your blood pressure, you think your blood pressure is like 155. You're like, oh God, you've got hypertension. You, you, you got you to really get that down, you might have a heart attack. And you tell yourself, well, I can't really know whether I have high blood pressure or not. I can't really know whether it's even blood. So I'm just not going to worry about it. And of course, is that going to work? No, it's just going to be like, if you go to your doctor and say, I don't, I don't even know if you exist. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it's just it doesn't, doesn't help. I mean, it's true you can doubt it. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm familiar enough with the skepticism. I don't know if, um, you know, if I, if, I, if I have blood, I don't know what the correct blood pressure to have is. But of course, that doesn't, doesn't help me get through the, the day. So from a purely pragmatic standpoint, it doesn't achieve its goal. It says, you know, well, if you be a skeptic. You'll be at peace. You won't worry about stuff. But there was no peace there. That was emptiness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because we were, you know, we were friends <laughs> like that doesn't. Saying I don't know, I don't know, that doesn't doesn't work. And people want, you know, people want, as a matter of psychology, people tend to want answers rather than just like no, <laughs> no answer. And so Christianity beat out the the skeptics, as did Islam and uh, other religions. <laughs> now, one of the big dogs of skepticism and anti-skepticism is our good day friend Rene Descartes. A little introduction for him, then that'll be the end of time. He was born March 31st, 1596, in La Haye, France, which is now named Descartes, France. There actually is a little boss here, France. You know, picture, really? yeah, picture of the song, yeah, presumably. They knew you were going to be a great man, and they named the man. Presumably, or my ancestors. <laughs> I think my ancestors actually were chased out of there. Uh, he went to school at La Fleche, got a degree in law, joined armies, met interesting people, killed them. And in November 1619, he had three vivid dreams. And he vowed to, to go on a mission in this life to do philosophy, to solve the problems. So how did he come to an end? Well, he wrote a lot of, lot of works. And in 16... <coughs> I'm dying with Descartes here. In 1649, uh, he got his, what it seemed to be his dream job. Because back then, if you were a philosopher, you wanted to be hired by like a noble, ideally a king or a queen, and be in the court. Because any king or queen or noble worth their, their throne or you know, crown would have a philosopher. And Queen Christina of Sweden hired him. He thought this would be great. Unfortunately, she was one of the people that liked to get up super early, so he had a teacher at 5 a.m. And Sweden is really cold. He wrote that Sweden is a land of ice and bears. So getting up early and being so cold, he caught pneumonia and died. February 11, 1650, and is still dead today, which teaches two important lessons. How many Don't, people got up? <laughs> it's you know, two important lessons. One being, don't get up too early. And second, don't go some places too cold. So have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday. Don't you